Our gospel lesson for this evening comes to us from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 17. Listen to God's word. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart the world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, Jesus loved them to the end. The devil had already decided that Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, would betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from supper, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. He began to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash your feet, you have no, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, then Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, Peter, one who is bathed does not need to wash except your feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you are clean. For he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had reclined again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, so also you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, Servants are not greater than their masters, nor are messengers greater than those who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of love, you who came to us in the flesh of Christ, Draw near to us once more, that as we remember Christ's supper with his disciples, his teachings, the meal they shared, and above all, his love, might we draw near to you and recognize that you are here with us. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts will be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I didn't know that I would marry my spouse when he first told me he loved me. And I didn't know I would marry him when he moved back to the college town where we met so I could finish my degree. Or when he surprised me with a weekend visit when we lived in separate states. I knew I was going to marry my husband when he brushed my grandfather's dentures. (laughs) This is going to tie together with the Last Supper. We had learned that Pap has, that Pap's cancer had returned while I was away for a week leading a workshop at a conference for youth. 
And Pap was in the hospital, they were running tests, and I couldn't be there. So I called my then boyfriend and said, listen, you need to go to the hospital. I need for you to be me and cheer Pap up. My dad will take care of all of the doctor stuff, but Pap needs some moral support, and you're the one to do it. Now, when I got home, I learned that he took this to heart and put it to action. Now, not only did he go and play my pap's lottery numbers and sit there and watch Jeopardy with him, but he actually baked a pineapple upside down cake and took it to the hospital because he knew it was my pap's favorite. Then he took his laptop in along with his collection of Bugs Bunny cartoons on DVD because he thought it might help Pap to feel better if he could laugh. And then he brushed his dentures because somebody needed to and Pap couldn't do it on his own. And that is when I knew we were going to get married. Love one another. Jesus says to his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. We hear this phrase year after year, and we hear every week that Jesus loves us. We have been hearing that since we were young kids, singing about Jesus' love for all. But as we gather here on this holy evening and remember the meal Jesus shared with his disciples, a meal that John tells us included a lengthy conversation in which Jesus said over again, love one another as I have loved you. We are invited to think and listen and hear what true love might look like. So often in our world, we measure love in hallmark moments, those moments we can capture on film, I guess now it's not film, it's our iPhones, um, when life is going just as we think it should. When we are in the midst of a beautiful celebration, when our kid is covered in mud or icing or paint and laughing hilar with hilarity. When we are having a picnic on the beach and there is not a cloud in the sky, or when the fireworks over the stadium make us smile and our face sparkle in bright and brilliant colors when we are getting sloppy kisses from a new puppy or the Christmas tree is ready to be revealed. Now, I would be the first to say that these moments are blessings. I will confess that my Christmas tree is actually still up. <laughs> but these moments are not measures of love. They might measure contentment, or joy, or hope. And certainly, love is a part of it all. But true love, the love that Jesus shows and the love to which he calls us, is really about something more. Love one another as I have loved you. I have preached on this text for years and the message embodied by Jesus in his actions in John's Gospel. I have talked about the humble servitude he embodies in his deeds. And frankly, I likely will again. But on this Thursday of Holy Week, I am struck by the love of a God who not only meets us in human flesh, but then encounters the human flesh of others 
by stooping down beneath them and touching their lowest and dirtiest places. This is the side of love that we don't often photograph. It's the side of love that we often don't discuss. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes us nervous. It makes us vulnerable to name the unmentionable parts of our lives that are messy. Whether it is the mess that comes with an extended illness or the mess that comes with an interpersonal conflict that we just can't seem to resolve. Jesus shows us that to love, to truly love, means to love a person and to love one's self and to love the community in which one finds oneself, even in the messy parts of lives. When we tend to bodies that are frail or hurting or wounded, when we engage the truths of our lives and our world that we often try to hide, to care for one another without first securing one's own comfort or authority or even one's own sense of safety, to love and to embody love when we have nothing personal to gain. Jesus tenderly holds the feet of each of his disciples, even the one he knows will betray him unto death. And he washes away the dirt of the road and encounters the messiness of the life and the world in which they live, not only so that they might be clean, but so that they might know through his touch that they belong. They belong to him and to the God whose flesh he has put on. They belong to one another who are gathered around that table in that room. And they belong to the world into which they will be sent to proclaim this love Christ is embodying before them. One commentator writes this, the act of foot washing in the ancient world symbolized not only humility, but also hospitality. In a culture where friends reclined at the table to eat, usually after long and dusty walks, foot washing was an essential step in inviting others to the community feast. This job was dirty and was one usually reserved for lowly servants, but it was extremely important. For to wash someone's feet was to recognize them as a welcome guest. It was to remove any barriers that might keep them from the table. And so Jesus washes one foot and then the next, not because he alone can make them clean, but because he alone can assure each person in their sin and frailty that they belong, that they are welcome, that they are God's own, and in fact, they will be God's body, God's hands and feet and heart reaching into a broken and hurting world. His action expresses a true love that can only be conveyed by drawing near to someone in those moments when they are not putting their best face forward, face forward, but their truest face. When they are letting you hold that part of them, that part of their story, that part of their body, that part of their lives, that just is a mess. True love 
is made visible when we greet others in the ugly tears of their grief, in the depth of their confusion or the weight of their sin. And when we convey through our welcoming embrace that they too are loved by God. Friends, in just a moment, we will approach the communion tables that have been set before you. Although we are not going to wash one another's feet, you are invited as you come forward to dip your hand in the baptismal font and to remember that mark of cleansing and that mark of belonging, that you have already been claimed by the God who truly loves you in Christ, sealed in your baptism. As you approach these tables, know that there is nothing that you bear that would keep you away from God's welcoming or loving embrace. For in life and in death, you, we belong to God. We will gather at these tables, remembering that even when life is messy or unpredictable or, or hard, God has called us as God's own. And that by the power of God's Holy Spirit, God is with us too, tending our messy places and strengthening us that we might love others, love someone else in theirs. As we approach the table of grace, as we journey toward the cross of Christ and then to the empty tomb, might we remember the hope we have in our faith and the call that we are the body of Christ sent into this world to love. Jesus said to his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. Friends, tonight, among us, may this be so. Amen.